as priests during the conference who are asked to come and talk. The way that we are petitioned and the talks that we are given hardly sound like a request. I guess the better term would be voluntold instead of volunteer for a talk. And the same was this talk for me. And as I was preparing for this talk under the title of Knowledge of Mary, I couldn't help but think to myself and kept fighting the temptation of they gave me the hardest talk of the whole retreat. All those good people have heard all the wonderful words about Our Lady through the different talks that have come out from the bishop's sermon to the keynote address. And I was thinking to myself, kind of feeling, having a little pity party. Why was I given this? What can I say that hasn't been said? And then I stopped myself and realized how much stupidity was in that mindset. For never could a person say enough about the glories of Mary and about our wonderful mother. As as St. John says at the end of his gospel, Many other things which our Lord said and did which are not written, but if they were all written, the world would not be able to contain the books that would be written therein. I believe the same applies for our Blessed Mother. Of all the beautiful words and all the beautiful talks that have been given during this conference, during this past year, during the past centuries, I think we only begin to scrape the surface of the glories of Mary. So where are we going to scrape? What part of the surface in this talk? Well, I looked at the title of the Conference. And I think I was inspired to start with the first word knowledge. What is knowledge? If you do the etymology of the word, I think it comes from the Old English. Snailese, something like that. I can't pronounce Old English. C N A L E C E. Sne they say. I believe that's something like that. But what it means is acknowledgement of a superior. Honor. Worship. Understanding. Understanding accomplishment. Wisdom. That last definition I like the best. The last two. Understanding, accomplishment, and wisdom. It's easy to know, okay, our Blessed Mother is greater than us. She was his mother. That's easy. Honor. Worship. Those two concepts often get mixed up. Protestants, Protestants say we worship our Blessed Mother. We say we honor her. The early writings of the church, the church fathers, they call her the Theotokos, the God-bearer, this is an honorable position, but only God is worshipped, but the God in her is worshipped. 
So we need to understand the accomplishments of our Blessed Mother, or rather, the accomplishments through our Blessed Mother. This is true wisdom, to comprehend how, why, or to start to comprehend the how and why God wants it. Knowledge of Mary. Now, of Mary, I think that we can go two directions on this, objective and subjective, or better put, public, private. But true devotion is true devotion. You can't have aspects of true devotion and... It turns into false devotion. No, if it's true, it's true. If it's false, it's false. That's the thing about the truth. Truth is absolute. How can you tell something's not true? All it needs is just a little bit of false in it. The ever smallest part. And you know, no, that's not, I don't want anything to do with that. You can walk away from it. Truth stands up for itself. Remember when Christ was standing before Pilate? All who are of the truth hear my voice. Pilate asked the question, and what is truth? And what did Christ say? Nothing. Because truth stands up for itself. So let us visit public revelation about our Blessed Lady. Or objective what a thing is, how we learn it through scripture. You've had quotes given to you already during this conference. During the keynote address, the quote was given to you from Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15. I'll put enmities between thee and the woman between thy seed and her seed, and she shall crush your head, and you shall lie in wait for her heel. The fathers had without a doubt pointed to the woman as our blessed mother, the woman of scripture. In scripture, we find prefigurements. You have Eve, Sarah, Rachel. Hannah, Esther, and Judith. Interesting about Hannah in the book of Samuel, the first book of Samuel, chapter 1, verse 20 you will find great similarities between what she says and what our Blessed Mother says to Elizabeth at the visitation in the Minificat. If you ever get a chance, do a little study of the Old Testament. We don't have, a, we don't have time to go into all of it here. All the prefigurements of the Old Testament. Of course, we know that Esther saves her people, going to the king and petitioning to the king in only the way Esther could, as our Blessed Mother saves us, only how she can when she goes before her divine son. Judith cuts the head of the enemy off. 
prefigures our blessed mother who was foretold in Genesis. She shall crush your head. The enemy is that loser, the devil. In the litany, we make reference to other prefigurements that we find in the Old Testament. The Ark of the Covenant. What was the Ark of the Covenant? In the Ark of the Covenant were placed the laws that were given to Moses from God. What else was placed in that Ark? The Rod of Aaron, which Moses used turned into a serpent before Pharaoh, made the Red Sea open so the chosen people could go to safety. Also, that rod was used in striking the rock for water to come out. So many significance in all that. The rod made of wood, the wood of the cross, the rock which water comes out of, the church. Cephas, upon this rock I will build my church. Petrus, water. The name for water in Latin is maris, maria. Interesting correlation there. We use this water. This water is always a promotion of life. Our Lord, in instituting baptism, uses water as an outward sign to make a human being a child of the Heavenly Father. We are reminded of this great institution every time we walk into church and we take holy water and we mark ourselves with it. An instrument Christ uses, but no greater instrument than our Blessed Mother, Maria, Ave Maria. Interesting side note, when our Lord talks about a devil being cast out of a soul, he says, and that spirit goes and wanders around in waterless places. Note how he terms evil as a place without water. Interesting, all the connections we could make. Also in the Ark of the Covenant, we have the manna, which God sent from heaven, able to give them life, sustain life, easy enough for a child to eat and digest and with Vitamins and minerals enough for a man to do a full day's work. Free gift. It would rain down manna from heaven. This is all in the Ark of the Covenant. And we call upon our Blessed Mother as the Ark of the Covenant. What's the symbol of the manna? Of course, that's so easy. That's Holy Communion. That's the Blessed Sacrament. Children can receive it. Adults can receive it. Food for the soul, for both a sinner and saint alike. It makes saints out of sinners and draws saints closer to their Heavenly Father. But all in the ark... On the Ark of the Covenant, we have adoring angels. If you ever take a look at a picture of the Ark, I believe there might be one over the stained glass window of our Blessed Mother. It 
How does this represent our blessed mother? Well, she's queen of heaven and earth, queen of angels and men. Titles our blessed mother, titles the church gives to our blessed mother. It reminds me of that song the nuns so beautifully sing, where it says, O oh, angels, you call her queen, but we, we call her mother. In the litany, we continue, Tower David. This is a Tower David built to keep back the enemy, a strong fortification. Why is she called the Tower of David? She keeps back the enemy. Right after this title is given to her in the litany, they follow up with Tower of Ivory. What is it? What's the significance there? Well, we can find similarities in Scripture. Solomon took ivory, made a, a chair out of ivory, and then coated it with gold. It's considered one of the most precious items he had. Ivory has a polish all into its own. Where other things are made, and through time they deteriorate and fall apart, ivory lasts through ages. When God made our blessed mother, when God made his own mother, made her beautiful, without stain of sin, bright, a polish all unto herself. Strong substance lasts through time. You cannot go wrong with this tower of ivory. Stability, unbreakability, Beauty. We go on through scripture. We read in the book of Isaiah 7, chapter 7, I believe, verse 14. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and he shall be great. He shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. Remember St. Joseph? He was going through this horrible trial after our Blessed Mother came back from visiting her cousin Elizabeth and and he found her with child. He was just so ashamed And humanly hurt, not understanding, not comprehending, still having a love for Mary, his espoused, but loving God and wanting to do God's will, understood that the law was pretty clear. You either, Jesus, she's either put to death or you put it away. Privately, he didn't want to displease God. One thing you have to love about St. Joseph in this whole scenario is that he didn't care what another creature thought more than what he cared about what God thought. And so having this trouble and this trial... It always... I always understood it as maybe he was just exhausted by going through it and he fell asleep. When I'm troubled about something, I can't sleep until I can't stay awake. And usually exhaustion takes over and 
I usually fall asleep when I'm not supposed to or stay asleep when I'm supposed to be getting up. Because when I'm supposed to be sleeping, I'm worrying. Maybe that's what happened to him. I don't know. That's my own thought, my own consolation. Whenever I'm going through something, I think of St. Joseph and how the angels came to him at night in his dreams. But when the angel comes to St. Joseph in a dream, telling him, do not be worried about taking Mary for your spouse, for your wife. He points right to Isaiah, the Old Testament. For he that will be born is God with us, is Emmanuel. It's God's will. Don't worry about it. I often thought about, I often think about St. Joseph and what he thought. fell asleep, having been worried about his his spouse being unfaithful. An angel comes to him, and we all would naturally think, oh, well, then he was probably overjoyed and was probably relieved. I don't think so. I think St. Joseph woke up from the dream and couldn't believe what type of vocation he had and what great job he had where so many others would want to run away. He was to care for the Son of God and his mother. And the Son of God would be his foster son. For the Holy Family was a true Holy Family. But you can see, it's not written in Scripture, but you can see where the consolation where Joseph was able to The well of consolation Joseph was able to drink from surely must have been our Blessed Mother. The one who had been misunderstood. We take a look at, of course, where where it concerns the term woman, the apocalypse. Chapter 12, verse 1. A woman clothed with the sun and a moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. In the books, in the book, The Glories of Mary, St. Alphonsus quotes a Richard of St. Lawrence, who identifies this verse and says, but it also says in Scripture in the Cantile of Canticles, in chapter 4, Come from Lebanon, my bride. Come from Lebanon. Come, you shall be crowned from the haunts of lions and from the leopard of the mountains. And St. Alphonse says, how can this be? We have our Blessed Mother with a crown of 12 stars in the Apocalypse presented to us. But in the Canticle of Canticle, from the Old Testament, she presented with beasts around her head. St. Alphonsus explains further in his book, these, ba- these beasts are sinners who, through Mary's favor and intercession, have become stars of paradise, making a better crown for this queen of mercy A better crown than all the created stars of the sky. Imagine that. But you see how it points how we point to scripture, we point to the Old Testament, tied in with the New Testament. Speaking of the New Testament and the Gospel of Saint Luke, chapter one, we read how 
The angel Gabriel was sent to a town of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin, a spouse to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And we hear the conversation that goes on. And Mary questions, not because she doubted, like Zachary, but questions because she wants to do God's will. We see this predominant in her life, wanting to do God's will. Our motto in life simply should be God first, always first. If we live that way, we will have no regrets. We'll have no spiritual problems. We'll have difficulty. The cross does get heavy. The path is narrow. But if there's ever a lesson that we can learn from our Blessed Mother's life, it is that God first, always first. Whether I understand it, whether I like it, whether I think This way or that way, God first, always first. We continue with scripture. Luke chapter 1 verse 39 through 56, we see Mary goes with haste to her cousin Elizabeth. And demonstrated to us through scripture is how our Lord wishes to work. Before our Lord is born, being forming forming in the womb of his mother. He starts his work. Elizabeth says, How shall it be that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For the moment I heard your salutation, the babe in my womb leapt for joy, and the fathers of the church. Make no bones about it. The doctors of the church identify that. It was at this moment that original sin was taken, was taken away from the precursor, John the Baptist in the womb of his mother. God makes use of instruments. Why? Because he needs to know, because he wants to. Do we understand it? We don't have to. All we have to understand is it's his will. And because it's his will, it's good. But we see how special she is. And Elizabeth identifies how special she is. And you see what our Blessed Mother, her response is? There's no false humility, no false pretense She is there to promote God's will. And God's will is, as she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. How can a creature magnify the Lord? Is he so small that you cannot see him? That he must be made bigger so others can see him? No. Magnifies the goodness of the Lord for others to see. Magnifies the greatness of the Lord as great as he is for others. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. You see how she points back to him? Any good that I have is because of him. It's not because of me. I didn't earn this. That's where we oftentimes get it wrong in our spiritual life. We somehow think if we go through this novena or we read that book or we know this quotation or we do this spiritual exercise that makes us holy. Those spiritual exercises can be a means of holiness and goodness only when they are attached to he who is good and holy. Not because we do them. That's the difference between saying your prayers and praying your prayers. 
saying the Hail Mary and praying the Hail Mary, saying your rosary and praying your rosary. And there's an absolute difference. And if we are to bring a change into this world, which I believe it's our vocation, it's our call to bring a change into this world, into this sinful black and bleak world, to make sure that we are those lights of the world, The darkness does not comprehend, as our Lord tells us, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before men so that they might see your good works and rejoice in your Father who is in heaven. Then we had better get busy and stop making the things that are supposed to be holy selfish. I'm so good because I go to church. No, we go to church to become so good. I'm so good because I went to communion today. No, you're better because you went to communion today. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowliness of his handmaid. For behold, all generations shall call me blessed. I couldn't help but think of Father Bernard's words at the keynote address where he says, God makes use of the weakest instruments to do his work. The scum at the bottom of the barrel should not be so proud as to consider themselves the cream of the crop. No, but they're blessed because he who is blessed is. They're good because he who is goodness itself makes use of them. God doesn't love us, as he says, because I think he was quoting St. Augustine. God doesn't love us because we're good or we're great. We're great or good because God loves us. It's almost an about face from the way our fallen human nature thinks. And we have the example there in our Blessed Mother. In this conversation, this one conversation where she has with Elizabeth. As we have already said, God can do whatever he wants, however he wants to do it. If he wanted to come down and redeem mankind by touching it with his pinky, the world would be redeemed. If he wanted to shed one tear, the holy writers say that one tear would be sufficient to have washed a multitude of sins from worlds to redeem worlds. So what a sublime lesson that Almighty God loves so great hides his divinity under the veil of humanity. Forms in the womb of an earthly mother and nine months in that formation time after it is completed is born People will say, well, of course, that's Christmas. That's just the way things are. No, no. It is most unique to see that God comes to us through Mary. And it's indeed important for us to pay attention to. Not just during the holiday seasons when we're going to decorate our house with lights and we buy presents and we have Christmas trees and even perhaps a manger scene in our house. You think, oh, it's so nice. Warm, fuzzy feelings because of the Christmas carols we hear in the background, the special treats we might have, 
Now we have all those special things because it's a special event. God unites his divinity with our humanity in order to elevate our humanity from its fallen state. That's the act of redemption through the act of the incarnation. How is he going to do this? That redemptive act on the cross. But it doesn't start from the wood of the cross. It starts from the wood of the cradle or the manger. And all this he does going through our blessed mother. And this is the thing that we need to pay attention to. Because it identifies how important she is. And she's that important because he chose her. He made her his mother. She is the woman of his story. She is the woman of history. From Genesis to the Apocalypse, if we pay attention to our scriptures, this is given to us over and over and over again. And if there has been ever a time when one ought to pay attention to this great mystery, it is now. In Matthew chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, it talks about the three wise men, or the wise men, I should say. We identify three through tradition, sacred tradition, I think. Well, at least the church holds out three as saints, so. But there may have been more. It says, Wise men came from the east. They saw his star. And it's interesting how, after their long journey, what scripture tells us they saw. Scripture doesn't say, and these wise men saw the child of promise. Scripture doesn't say, and these wise men saw the Redeemer of the world. Scripture doesn't say, these wise men saw Emmanuel, God with us. You know what Scripture says? These wise men saw the child with Mary, his mother. Identifying how important the whole concept is. Mary's his mother. And a great thing is about to happen. After being with his mother... He would give his most prized possession to us on account of the love that he had for us. If we will have her. See, there's an act of the will that needs to follow the intellect. I think we heard one of the speakers talk about that. You can't just have the intellect. And know all this knowledge and do nothing about it. No. You must receive the knowledge and then do something about it. Of course, we have in Luke chapter 2, Simeon. Identifying the Messiah. Now thou, thou, thou canst dismiss thy servant, O Lord, in peace. The salvation of Israel and a revelation to the Gentiles. And then what does he say? He turns to the mother and says, Thy own soul, a sword, shall pierce. 
We have our nice little cute pictures of our Blessed Mother of Sorrows, and they have a nice little dagger. If you take a look at the Greek, I can't recall the exact word right now, but it's not just a little dagger. It's one of those curved swords that would do horrible devastation if ever a heart was to come in contact with it. This is what Simon or Simeon was telling our Blessed Mother. Why? Well, miraculously she conceived our Lord and miraculously she gave birth. But there was another birth that she was to be the mother of, and that was us. And the birth pains were at the foot of the cross. We'll get to that in just a moment. We have in Matthew chapter 2, verse 13, the angel once again appearing to Joseph doesn't say, save the child, Herod seeks his life. Tells Joseph, though, Herod seeks the life. Take the child and his mother. See, the two go together. Of course, as we read further, we read about in St. Luke, chapter 2, where our Lord is lost, and they find him in the temple. And our Blessed Mother asks, Son, why why have you done this to us? Thy father and I have been seeking thee in sorrow. And his reply was, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? And scripture makes sure that we know that her heart is affected. And she ponders all these things in her heart. Remember, What she wanted was God's will. In John chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, we read how our Lord begins his public life. How does he begin his public life? By a request of our blessed mother. Mary sees a need sees the solution in her son, goes to her son and says, they have no wine. And he gives her that title, the woman of his story, and says to her, the woman, that would crush the head of the serpent, woman, what is that to me or to thee? My hour has not yet come. It's a very poor translation of what is written in the original. The original is, Woman, what is mine is thine. My hour has not yet come. Whenever our Lord talks about his hour, in the gospel, he's talking about his passion and his death. What is mine is thine. Interesting. I've always wondered why they didn't put that in scripture, because it says so much. It shows the inseparability of our Blessed Mother and our Lord. You can't have one without the other. It's an impossibility. Our Lord would not have become man without our our Blessed Mother, and our Blessed Mother wouldn't have been preserved without our Lord. As we began this conference, you want to find the king, find the queen. You want to have the child, go to the mother. You want our Lord. Have a devotion to our Blessed Mother. For there is Mary, there is Jesus. And of course we have 17 chapters later in the book of St. John. When he gives the gift to us, the disciple. 
Remember what our Lord says in that term disciple? If you want to be my disciples, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. He calls us disciple. So the scripture identifies as Father Bernard or Bernard said in his keynote address, doesn't say John, but goes with the term disciple. Behold your mother. How can the human mind comprehend this? God becomes man, preserves a creature from its fallen state, from original sin, in order so that he has a pure portal to go and do his work. He can do it. He's God. Nine months, he is born. On this earth, through her. We read how he is lost. But after that, we read about 30 years of silence. He grew in age and grace and wisdom before God and man. And he was with her for 30 years. Begins his public life by her request for somebody else. Because they were going to be embarrassed at their wedding, on their wedding day. And then he gives her to us. In the Acts of the Apostles, you can almost hear the conversation take place. In chapter 1, the conversation that's not written, but which led to the event or events, events we read about in chapter 1, verses 12 through 14 of Pentecost. If there's something we read about in Scripture, we read how the apostles were always kind of arguing with one another. They were arguing which one's going to be the greatest. Peter, in the Last Supper, was cursing and swearing that he would never do it. He was, didn't want to lose face in front of the other apostles. They're very human. Thomas is doubting things. Philip's not getting it. Show us the Father and it is enough. Philip, haven't I been with you this long? And you do not understand that they who see me see the Father as well? But I think the conversation probably kind of went something like they witnessed the ascension. They're standing there. The angels, are sent, tell, the angels tell them, What are you doing here, men of Galilee? You have a job to do. And that job doesn't have anything to do with the weather. Why are you looking? He's going to come when he decides he's going to come. You have a job. And they're walking back. And they really don't know what to do. Their hearts are heavy for their good Lord has left them. He told them it was important for them for him to go, but they still didn't understand because the spirit who would make them understand wasn't yet sent to them. The doubts in Thomas start rising again. Philip is probably not helping matters out with his side thoughts. The apostles start questioning, well, wow, maybe we should, and going back around. And I think at that point, John makes a stand, goes to Peter. We see how John respected Peter because Christ wanted it so. We see it at the resurrection. Peter runs, and John runs to the cave. John beats Peter, but John doesn't go into the cave. He waits for Peter. This is just my own thought. But John, in the midst of their whole conversation, as they're leaving that mount where the ascension took place, says, 
I know what we should do. And Peter says, wait, wait, people, quiet. Okay, what's that, John? I know what we should do. What's that? Let's go to her. Remember I told you from the cross? He gave her to us. Remember he said, behold your mother. Well, let's go to her. She'll know what to do. And then began the first novena, the most powerful novena for the coming of the Holy Ghost. How God works through this wonderful creature of his. His most pure and beautiful daughter. Obedient at his request. His most loving and perfect mother. And her... And his sweet and holy spouse. As the Holy Ghost came upon her, so the apostles would go to her and after they had prayed with her would come upon them. Now it comes to us. Subjective. Where we talked about Knowledge of Mary, our knowledge of Mary. We can gather all this knowledge, but it's just all out there. There's libraries with books in them. But it doesn't make libraries smart or it doesn't make them grow or perfected. What are we going to do with all this knowledge? This is where we consider our devotion. There is no question that you good people in this church want to have a true devotion to our Blessed Mother. Why else are you here? Of course you do. But that devotion can only be had one way and for one purpose. One who has true devotion to our Blessed Mother is one who wants to go to Jesus to her. It is not true devotion when we use our Blessed Mother or any type of devotion to our Blessed Mother as some type of a superstitious lucky charm. Or if I say this prayer or if I do this, I won't go here and I won't do that. Not at all. The main reason why we have a devotion to our Blessed Mother is to get closer to Him. When we truly go to her, And we open our eyes, we only see one thing. She points more clearly to him. That's why when she came to Fatima, she said, My son desires that you have a devotion to my Immaculate Heart. That you make reparation. It's not my wish, it's his wish. And because it's his wish, it is my wish. The great fiat sums up the life of our Blessed Mother. The fiat she lived the fiat her son lived and the fiat her son preached. Remember when the apostles, they wanted to learn to pray. They heard our Lord preach that great sermon on the mount. And they came to him all excited and said, Lord, teach us to pray. What a great request. In itself is a prayer. The apostles and their request for our Lord, their petition to teach them to pray. I wonder how many of us think we know how to pray and never ask the good Lord or his blessed mother in all humility to teach us, to talk to them properly. Most people think that they pray because they have big books that they read out of. And part of the problem with their prayer is they never shut up and let the good Lord speak. Scripture says, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Not heareth, Lord, thy servant speaketh. But far too often, too many have that mentality. And what a waste of time. But not us. 
So when our Lord teaches them to pray, he said, this is how you should pray. Our Father. Those two words, so beautiful. God is my Father. My Father? Really? I'm his son? It doesn't make me just regal or rich or beautiful, powerful. It makes me eternal. Our Father. Where is my Father? Who art in heaven? Well, then wait a minute. That must mean that my home is not here. I think Father Casimir talked about this. And the detachment from the world. Be in the world, but not of the world. If he's my father, then my home is heaven. How many of us really believe that and live each day to get there? And nothing else matters. Not what type of video game we play or what type of show we watch or if our football team wins the Super Bowl or if the World Series goes this way or that way or whatever. First things first. Those things are okay. We can enjoy those things that are not sinful. But how many, how many of us really put as much effort as we do with our emails and, oh, we have to keep up with this and we have to keep up with this show and we have to do this and we have to do that as we do with our Father and our home, which is heaven. And our Father is holy to his very name. Hallowed be thy name. Therefore, we, his children, must be holy. And then our Lord identifies, highlights, bolds, italicizes the word fiat. Fiat voluntas tua. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Not my will, but thine be done. That was his prayer in the garden. That has to be our prayer. And that was our blessed mother's prayer first. Fiat miki secundum verbum tuum. Be it done to me according to thy word. That has to be the whole basis of our devotion. When we go to our blessed mother... We go to her as children of hers, trusting, confident, not in our prayers, not in our words, not in our deeds, not in ourself, but in her. Our life, our sweetness, and our hope. What makes her this? No, I should not say what. Who makes her this? Her son. He who is mighty has done great things to her. And through her to us. I have a bunch of books here that I didn't even open. I was going to read a few things. But I'll end with a story. When I was first a priest, you're, you go on what you call the victory tour, I guess. New priest gets to go to a new parish, and they're, ooh, new priest. wonder what his sermon is going to be like. wonder how he's going to hear confessions. You go around, and that wears off after you've been a priest for a good amount of years. Been a priest now, I think, for 18 years. But I still remember I was in California. I was taking Father Radecki's place. And there was this kind older lady who um, had befriended me when I was out there helping Father Dominic before I stayed at her place. And she wanted to take me to Santa Barbara. Now, when you're in California, you're 
coming from the likes of eastern Washington or Colorado or Nebraska. It's nice to see the ocean when you don't see it all the time. So you want to take me out, see the ocean. It was a nice day. We got out there. I still remember. We went to Wendy's. Why do I remember we went to Wendy's? Because we, I got a phone call. Cell phones weren't like they are now. Everybody has one now, but back then they didn't. Had this little pager. It buzzed and gave a phone number, and I had to go find a phone and make a phone call. And this lady on the other line was telling me, Oh, Father So-and-so, he's in the hospital. He needs, to, he needs a priest right away. It's a matter of great emergency. Uh, okay, being a new priest, you don't ask the questions that you ask now. Okay, what do you mean by emergency? Does he have a splinter in his finger? That's not an emergency. But I was like, okay, all right. So got, got into the car. Smell of burgers that we just bought in the car, and I had to, we had to go. And I, I'm like, oh boy, what do I do? Uh, where's the tabernacle key? At? Is the sacristan going to be there? How am I, I going to get the blessed sacrament? Where are the oils? Uh, all these things I remember. I was frantic. I remember we had Wendy's because I don't remember tasting. I remember, I remember craving, enjoying the lunch, but I don't remember tasting a bite of it (laughs) because I was so caught up with worry and concern and making sure I was going to do this right. And we headed back from Santa Barbara to Santa Clarita, which is not a short trip, especially through traffic. We got to the church, got the ritual, got the the oils, found out how to get the blessed sacrament, went over to the hospital. I didn't know where the hospital was. We make our way through that labyrinth of a city until we found the hospital that this man was in. I got there. The woman wasn't there. I called her up. Oh, yeah, I left. But he's in there and everything else. So I go and I talk to the doctor. Doctor tells me, okay, I'll I'll be right back. Goes back. Comes back. Goes, he doesn't want to see a priest. Doesn't want to see a priest. Not even to talk to him? No. I go, is he in danger of death? I mean, what, I mean what's wrong with him? I was, oh, no. He just had a little anxiety attack. I'm like, what? So he's not in danger of death at all? No, and he doesn't want to see a priest. Nope. <laughs> Needless to say, I was fighting great temptations against this lady. Especially after battling a little bout of indigestion on account of the way we handled lunch that day. Anyways, I said, I'm not leaving here until I go and see the guy. At least go talk to him. So I went and, I went and finally he said, yes, I'll, I'll see the priest. So I went in there and tried to talk to him. And I remember we were praying. We had prayed the rosary. And I went in there to talk to the guy. And the guy really didn't want to see a priest, and he wasn't in danger. So I finally talked to him in for me to give him a simple blessing. I gave him a simple blessing, walked out. And I felt pretty rejected. I felt like, you know, just for a young priest... Those little rejections are great downers. I walked out. I remember I must have had my head down or something. I was like, wow, I didn't know what to think. And I practically ran into this young lady. I mean, she was oriental. And she had tears just coming down. Whoa, uh, excuse me. Uh, Are you okay? She's crying, and she goes, my, my grandfather just died. I go, well, I'm really sorry to hear that. Try to give her condolences. And I found uh, something clicked in my head. Just died. I went, when? Just a minute ago, he stopped. 
he's in over there. He just stopped. I go, oh, is there anything I can do? He goes, are you a Catholic priest? I go, yes. I go, how long ago did he die? He goes, not even five minutes ago. <laughs> um, yeah, I can go pray prayers for the dead and give him extra unction. I can do that within a half an hour to an hour. And there I was, and I found out the man was a Catholic and had had a devotion to our Blessed Mother, I have no doubt. Because I, I had rosaries with me, and my, I remember my, my depression or discouragement was turned into great elation. I had given this guy the last sacrament. So why was I there? I have no doubt it is because of her, because of our Blessed Mother. There's no way that I would have been there at that hospital had not all those events just kind of fell into place. And I was there at that moment with my head walking out of the room at that time and ran into that, or basically ran into that young lady. And moments later, in front of this man, who I'm sure was moments before he was to go before the Almighty, and having the blessings and absolutions of Holy Mother of the Church, I know they had a devotion to our Blessed Mother because I hand out rosaries, made sure you know, they all had scapulars, and he had a scapular on. And What a wonderful mother we have. What a wonderful queen we have. How powerful she is. How powerful against the enemy, the foe, and how powerful for us to get to our home, which is in heaven, and to be with her son, who is our brother, for all eternity. So, my dear friends, with this knowledge of Mary, which St. Louis Minimafra talks about, Yes, let us, when we hear of these things from Scripture about our Blessed Mother, let's take them to heart. Let's remind ourselves of how powerful she is, how good she is. And she is so powerful and good because he who is mighty has done great things to her and works to her for us. And we can go back to he who is powerful so he can do great things to us and make us great saints and strong in these great times that we live in. Because I do not think there is another way to get to heaven unless you go to Jesus, who said, without me, you can do nothing. But I think you must go to Jesus through Mary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.